Good evening and welcome to this Festival of Debate event. At the Festival of Debate, we're committed to providing an environment that is welcome. Good evening and welcome to this Festival accessible of Debate and event. Of all and for the team members Good evening, everybody. And I'm, we're having some slight technical difficulties here, but I'm going to assume that we're live on the assumption that uh, that's where we're going. Uh, welcome, everyone, on this Friday evening and special brownie points for joining us at the point where um, uh, we know this is the uh, first Friday night that the pubs are open. So if you're joining us live, that's true dedication. Um, but if you watch you later on, well, we appreciate you joining us then, too. Uh, just to remind everybody that um, we will on the various streams this is going out on questions we posted there and they'll be fed through uh to me and to are we putting them to our panel tonight uh and you know, i think this is a really important subject and we have had lots of people sign up tonight uh two is the uk's financial system more blight than blessing um and a background to this um since we're we're in sort of friday night entertainment territory there's a lovely quote which I actually learnt from Tim Jackson, uh, author of um, Prosperity Without Growth and more recently Post-Growth. Uh, and this comes from uh, Noah Hawley's black comedy, uh, Fargo. And in it, and I'm not going to do the accent, but in it, a gangster is told, the sooner you realise there's only one business left in the world, the money business, just ones and twos, the better off you're going to be. And... That, I think, expresses beautifully in words of one syllable very clearly what's been described much more sort of technically as the financialization of our whole economy and society. And, you know, some of my favourite examples of that are the fact that our water companies are now run as private businesses loaded with debt, profits, uh, dividends being hived off into tax havens, uh, our care homes. Um, I was just talking actually to a young journalist in Sheffield this week about how hedge funds own care homes and take your know, often 12 to 16% return out of those care homes. So next time you hear someone saying all the care homes can't afford to um, can't afford to pay the uh, in slightly increased supposed real living wage, still not a real living wage, um, you might want to think about that. Uh, but what I've been thinking about this, all of this a great deal lately is because in the House of Lords, as the Green Party member in the House of Lords, um, I've been taking part in debates on both the finance bill, uh, the financial services bill, um, which is essentially replacing European uh, regulation with our own homegrown regulation of the financial sector and also the national security and investment bill. And one of the things that was really quite terrifying and disturbing was how little legislative scrutiny there actually was. At the same time as I was doing that, um, we had the domestic abuse bill going through and there were on, on each amendment there, uh, often half a dozen or a dozen people passionately involved, passionately engaged, really sharing their deep knowledge and understanding of the issues. And when you got to the financial services bill, uh, you had half a dozen people and probably the majority of the amendments actually came from the uh, Tory and further right right, uh, seeking to um, loosen the trolls on the financial sector. So the two speakers who will be joining me this evening both were hugely helpful and thank you to them for that um, in aiding my contributions, informing my contributions in those debates. And that was the reason really why I wanted to have this event this evening because Sheffield had, you know, we're going around the country, around, around the world, but we're, we're based from the festival debate in Sheffield. And Sheffield has a great radical political tradition and some great work being done here. Um, and the first of our speakers who I'll ask to introduce himself tonight, uh, Andrew Baker, uh, is indeed here at Sperry, the, uh, oh, uh, let me see, I do, I do know this, the Sheffield Political Economy Research Institute. Acronyms are always a challenge. Um, and um, so, Andrew, perhaps if I can get you to just sort of introduce yourself and your interests briefly and, and you know, this terrible question that I know speakers always hate, you know, tell us something about yourself that you wouldn't find out from the internet. Okay. 
Um, so uh, my, my title is Professor of Political Economy, um, University of Sheffield. My formal affiliation is with the Department of Politics, International Relations, but I also have this link to Sperry, the Sheffield Political Economy Research Institute, as you mentioned, Natalie. My real interest is, um, is, is how economic ideas, um, can, whether, whether they can be politically transformational, and what that process entails, what the political obstacles are to that, and how, how you overcome those political obstacles. And the unconventional thing about myself, I am uh, an owner and uh, a director of a, of a non-league football club, well, a semi-director, uh, an advisor, if, if anything, uh, called City of Liverpool Football Club. And that's a fan-owned cooperative, and it's providing alternative football in the City of Liverpool. So that's the unconventional fact about myself. Well, that's absolutely lovely. And, you know, uh, given our news recently about football and football, perhaps if you will oh, forgive me, it's slightly the other end of the, um, of the certainly the other end of the financial scale um, is very much an issue. And indeed something, you know, we've, I've been talking about for a long while that, you know, we'd like to see that right through our football, fan-led, fan-owned, fan-controlled. But um, that's not the top, well, it kind of ties into the topic this evening, but not too many questions on football, please. It does well, because we believe in a, in, a, in a philosophy of community wealth building as well, so. Ah, okay, well, we, we might get back to that a little bit more. Um, I'm just going to introduce our second speaker here. Um, Nick Shackson um, is someone who I uh, have known for a long time. I first met in a pub in Camden, which Nick may not recall, but it was, oh, I don't know, at least a decade ago. Um, and But perhaps, Nick, if you can sort of introduce yourself and say a bit about your interests and what you're doing. Okay, thanks, uh, Natalie. Yeah, so I'm, uh, uh, I, I kind of wear two hats, really. Uh, I'm a journalist. Uh, that's one of my hats, and I've been I've been a journalist since uh, the mid '90s. Um, I started out looking at oil and politics in West Africa, and then I moved on to kind of financial globalization, and that's my that's been my field ever since. And so, sort of finance in an international context, and and I've always been interested in just digging around weird places finding weird things and trying to fit them into a picture that's coherent and kind of um, fits with other things. And I, um, so that's kind of, you know, trying to understand how things fit together is, is my thing. So that's my sort of journalistic hat. My other hat is as a campaigner. So I have very strong opinions. I, I think anybody who studies finance um, is going to have strong opinions. I, you know, if you're in the system, and you're making a lot of money about it, you're probably going to have strong opinions that, yeah, this is great. But if you actually investigate what's going on you know if you read the financial times for example lots of those journalists really are angry about what you can tell you know they have to be very sort of impartial and just report you know the facts and stuff you can tell they're really angry about what's going on this is really terrible stuff going on in the financial center uh, financial sector um so i also i have been working with an organization called the tax justice network which campaigns against tax havens um, i wrote a book called treasure islands about tax havens that came out about 10 years ago and I uh, wrote another book, another very activist book called The Finance Curse. I mean, the, the name of it clearly is an activist name um, that looks at the perils of oversized financial centers, which is really the subject we're talking about today. So, yeah, those are my, my two hats, a journalist on the one hand and a campaigner, activist campaigner on the other. Um, and on the subject of hats, um, Natalie asked me to say some weird detail about myself, much more modest than Andrew's, and um, I cut my own hair, obviously. So that's me. <laughs> very, very good. Uh, and um, I think what you said about the FT was interesting because one of the things I find, I mentioned water privatisation and the Financial Times is actually one of the places, certainly before the pandemic anyway, they were basically running a story a week saying how dreadful water privatisation was. And they've actually started to really focus on the care home issue as well. So um, uh, you do find, you know, it's where you find some of the most interesting, really critical journalism, um, surprisingly enough, is in the Financial Times. So... Our topic really tonight to sort of get into the meat of it. Um, and I'm going to start with you, Nick. Um, and you mentioned the book Treasure Islands. Um, and I have to give you credit also for alerting me to the whole issue of the remembrancer uh, in the place of the City of London within the British Parliament, which is something I've been working on ever since. But it focused particularly on tax havens in your particular. But your latest book in 2018, as you mentioned, was about the finance curse. Can you explain what the finance curse is? why it matters yeah, okay. and how you came up with the term. Yeah, I mean, 
it's actually been a bit of a journey, and I think that sort of helps understand what the finance curse curse is. So I, I did, as I mentioned, I started out oil and politics in West Africa, and I was a correspondent in Angola during the civil war in the, in the 90s, um, and I covered those countries a lot on um, up and down uh, Africa's western coastline, oil-rich countries, all deeply troubled, Nigeria, Angola, Gabon, um, Equatorial Guinea, um, Cameroon, all, all very troubled. And... At the time that I was starting to research this stuff, um, academic researchers were coming up with something called the resource curse, which is a thesis that um, countries that have, you know, that are dependent on commodities like oil, for example, um, tend not only, there's kind of two elements of it. One of it, you know, the money all gets stolen. We all, we all know that. And, um, you know, so they don't, they're not really able to harness those resources for, for national development. But there's actually a much more interesting side to it is that these countries in many cases, and certainly in Angola when I was there, end up poorer. All this, all these riches make them poorer than they were if they hadn't found these, this oil at all. Um, it's, kind of, it's, it's otherwise known as the paradox of plenty. So, uh, and, and there's lots of reasons for that, which we, which we can get into, but um, it, the, the biggest problem is that oil sort of coming in at the top of a system shapes the system and kind of corrupts the system. and in the end, it gives power to the people at the top to, you know, extract wealth from everybody else and protect themselves with oil money, um, you know, pay for the paramilitary police or whatever, if anybody gets angry. So that's the resource curse. And that was my kind of starting point. Um, I was back in uh, about 2007. I was I just about to publish my first book about, called Poison Wells about the resource curse in Africa. And I came across a character called John Christensen, who had been the economic advisor to the British tax haven of Jersey. And he um, he was kind of like a dissident, even though he had been in this very se senior position. He, he had um, decided the whole system of tax havens was rotten. Um, and he started investigating it. And he, as an economist, he began to sort of piece together how this system worked and how big it was. And um, he was just in the process of putting this together, this sort of new way of analyzing tax havens. Because I think at the time people were thinking, you know, tax havens are these kind of exotic sideshows to the global economy with, you know, a few mafiosi and, and um, you know, multinationals, but nothing really to worry about, just sort of something slightly entertaining with a bit of a James Bond kind of frisson there. And, but he was, I, I met him and I had this long meeting with him several hours in London. And, you know, he laid out, this is much bigger than anybody thinks. This is the heart of financial globalization. This is the sort of dark heart of it all. Um, this is where so much stuff is going on now. All the multinationals, all the richest people are all using tax havens. Um, and also the tax havens weren't where we thought they were because everyone had images back then. I think this is this image has changed now quite substantially, but everyone was that back then, you know, tax havens were these sort of palm fringed, fringed islands in the Caribbean and maybe Switzerland and a couple of other places. But what he was telling me is that the heart of this system, of this offshore system is in, a, in our biggest countries. You know, the United Kingdom is, is in is arguably the most important player in the entire offshore system. It runs this system of British territories around the world, Cayman Islands and so on, um, uh, British Virgin Islands, Jersey, uh, but it also has many sort of offshore characteristics itself. And so I, so I wrote the book Treasure Islands very much, um, I, I made a kind of career pivot at that point, like this is so interesting, nobody's talking about, it. I have to start investigating this. And, and I started talking to John pretty much every day. I wrote, Treasure Islands, which kind of laid laid this out, published around 2010, laid this out in a in a kind of organised way. It was a sort of first book, I think, to to look at this from a sort of econ particularly an economic perspective, but also a cultural perspective. You know, what are the people in these places thinking, and why are they doing this? Um, and you know, it, I, I think it had quite some influence. So I was I was kind of researching this, but John and I had started talking about something else then. Um, so he, as economic advisor in Jersey was tasked with making life better for people in Jersey. And that was part of his job. You know, how do we promote industry? How do we promote agriculture? And he realized very quickly that the financial sector was destroying everything else. It was killing, you know, manufacturing. There used to be decent manufacturing there. There used to be a great tourism industry. There used to be all sorts of, you know, the Jersey royal potatoes and Jersey cows and all that, you know, thriving agricultural sector on this little island. And finance was just squashing everything. Um, and there's there's various reasons for which we which we can go into it into. Um, but you know, one of the biggest was that all the best and brightest people 
um, was getting were getting sucked out of these other sectors and and into finance, and so all these other sectors were crumbling. And there were various other things that were that were pressing on these sectors. But he was thinking, um, okay, this is Jersey. This is definitely happening in Jersey. And we but we started discussing, you know, is this happening in the UK? Is the city of London too big? And um, very quickly, you know, once we started thinking about it, clearly, um, it. It, you know, there was no doubt at all that the city of London was having the same effect in the UK. It was sucking, you know, all the best, you know, lots of people I, I studied with went into the city and they could have gone into something like, I don't know, inventing a cure for COVID or whatever. Um, but they went into the city. And, and so a lot of these very kind of, so there was this huge brain drain out of, um, out of big parts of the economy. Um, there's also um, uh, all sorts of governance problems when you, your economy becomes dependent on finance um, it starts getting into all kinds of games that are very predatory on your own economy. So we started discussing this and it was a kind of natural progression from tax havens because tax havens are places that transmit harm outwards to other countries. It's at their financial centers that transmit harm outwards. The finance curse was saying, if you host a financial center in your own country, um, you transmit harm inwards to your own country. And uh, it, as we started putting this together, and we put, put a first kind of um, informal paper out in 2013, just laying out laying out the issues. Um, but just around then, a whole series of academic research has has um, come uh, come forward, which uh, has uh, basically shown the finance curse going on. We all need finance. We you know we need banks. We need to save our money. We need to you know small businesses need their need to raise money and. Um, you know, we need banks, we need finance, but how much finance do we need? And all this research um, comes up with this. I'm, I'm going to finish in a second. This is this is the end. We can talk about the reasons in, um, later on. But basically, there's this kind of upturned banana shape um, and it's a graph. And the graph is how does your financial sector support you, the development of your economy, support economic growth and prosperity and all these things? When you have no finance at all, you need more of it. So you grow your financial sector and your economic growth gets supported, your society, your economy and whatever gets supported. But you get to this kind of optimal point where you're at the top, and that's the sort of place where you wanna be, where the financial sector is doing all the things it needs to do for your economy, um, but no more. But then if you keep expanding your financial sector beyond that point, it starts harming the economy. And this has been measured in country after country. And there's, there's the whole kind of body of academic research, which I, I can put, um, links to it in the comments if anybody's interested but basically the more you grow your finance beyond this sort of this sweet spot this optimal point the more it damages economic growth and um it um, and so this is a kind of you know relationship that is kind of hidden people aren't really talking about it. and I, I think conceptually people find it very difficult to get this idea how can more money make us poorer you know how can more finance make us poorer but it very much is the case the city of london is much too big this is the thesis of my book, the, the Finance Curse, um, and because it's not only too big, but the bits that have grown too big are the, are the bits that are causing harm, that are sort of predatory, that are, um, are causing damage in, in the UK economy. So that's kind of the finance curse, and I've probably gone on for too long. I'll hand over now. That's all right. That's, I think that was a great introduction. Um, and as you were talking about, you know, the idea that finance should be there to serve the real economy, the people who make things and build houses and all of that. Um, I mean, that's something I, even before the finance bills, you know, I would say in the House of Lords quite often facing across to the Tories who many of whom in these debates come from the financial sector. And when you say the financial sector should be focused on serving the real economy, they sort of look at you like you've just sort of, you know, provided a, um, a, a recipe for, for a Richard's brew or something is this very, very strange idea. But I think, you, know, Nick, you've introduced the idea of the finance curse and how it was developed. Andrew, you did a, a great report that, as I said before, I was citing a great deal in the House of Lords on the civic uh, UK aspects. Um, could you give us an academic take on the finance curse? Yeah. Um, first of all, let me say that it's nice to learn that I share something else in common with Nick Shackson, apart from an interest in the finance curse, that I also cut my own hair, as you can tell from this rather unkempt barnet that I have currently. Um, I can't remember exactly how it came about, but Nick and John were in contact with me for some time about the concept of the finance curse. I'd seen their idea. I was observing uh, many of the same symptoms they were referring to in my work and my research. 
But I think what John and Nick effectively did when they set out that finance curse framing in 2013 is they put the pieces together and they said, this looks as though it is part of a wider, deeper structural dynamic. And that was something I instantly recognized. But as a cautious academic, I essentially said, hang on a minute, we need a better, uh, we need more evidence and we need a better understanding of how the respective pieces fit together in different contexts. And I actually remember being marginally peeved that, uh, that I didn't come up with the term first. I felt as though it was right on the tip of my tongue, but John and, John and Nick came up, came up with the term first. The piece of research that Natalie refers to was done in conjunction with American scholars at the University of Massachusetts and the University of Columbia. And what it did was it tried to come up with a price tag for the UK economy from having an oversized financial sector. And the price tag we came up with was 4,500 billion between 1995 and 2015, over a 20 year period. Um, so let me tell you a little bit more about how we came up with that number. We, we, we asked basically what evidence is there to suggest that the UK may have performed better economically if it had had a smaller financial sector between 1995 and 2015. Um, and we picked those years just because they were the previous 20 years. Um, and the purpose was to generate a headline figure, and we were going to release that to coincide with the launch of Nick's book deliberately. Um, and what we were intending to do there was really get people's attention and to try and start a conversation. We, we had a formula for that calculation that my co-authors had used and applied to the United States. So the figure calculated is for costs over and above those likely to be experienced if the financial system were operating at a more optimum level. So Nick referred to some of the academic literature and in economics, there is a too much finance literature. And basically what that does is it uses cost, cross country aggregate data sets to identify an optimum size for the financial sector. That's the, the peak of Nick's banana. Uh, and on that basis, we constructed a counterfactual growth pathway for the UK based on the data coming out of that literature. And that literature also controls for growth that the financial sector contributes to the economy. So that figure is also taken into account in our figure of 4,500 billion in cumulative lost growth between 1995 and 2015. So briefly to say a little bit more about that number, there were three categories in it. One was the cost of the 2008 financial crisis. And the premise there is quite simple, that finance curse countries or, or, or countries blighted by a finance curse tend to experience bigger financial crises that last for longer. Um, the second category is something that's referred to in that too much finance literature as, as, as misallocation. And this is a bit of a black box, but Nick alluded to some of the things that are going on in there. That one of them, is, is, is a crowding out effect where, where the financial sector attracts resources and takes them away from other sectors. Another one is a kind of more predatory extractive relationship an oversized financial sector can develop uh, with, other, with, other, with other sectors. So it sucks resources away from them uh, through extractive means. Nick referred to a brain drain effect and that's another one that, that kind of can, comes into this misallocation effect where you end up with people with PhDs in physics working in the city of London. And a, and a further effect is a kind of distortion of prices. So one of the things that countries with a big financial sector tend to have is an overappreciated exchange rate, and that makes it more difficult for, for export sectors to compete. Our third category was excess profits and salaries. Um, and in the UK case, that figure came to 400 billion. We actually took it out for the UK, and I want to explain why we did that. We did it because really the city of London's role in, a, in global terms is to act as a kind of uh, global handling agent. And many of the fees from which it makes profits are charged uh, to foreign investors. So we made a very generous assumption, and it is a very generous assumption, that that, that, that was a little, that those excess uh, profits and salaries were at no little or no cost to the domestic economy. So we took that number out. Had we included it, the number would have been even bigger. It would have been 5,100 billion. Now, those other two categories uh, of costs that I mentioned, the crisis and, and misallocation uh, figures, 
um, they generated an, a, a range of numbers. Uh, uh, and so we always pick something towards the lower end of the range uh, as, as, as the overall number to contribute to the total. So I think what we can say is that we were very conservative in putting that figure together and actually quite cautious. The, the one thing I would flag here uh, is that the aggregate cost for the, for the United States when, when, we, when the numbers were run for the United States was that they lost about a year's worth of GDP. For the UK in a 20 year period, it was around 2.5 or two and a half times uh, an average year's GDP in that period. So the effect is much more pronounced. Um, now, what I'd say here is you can always pick away at headline number, but that number is telling us something. Uh, more significant is when you dig behind that number, 60% of the costs in the UK case come from, come from this misallocation process. So that's crowding out, it's the extraction effect, it's that brain drain, it's things that prevent reinvestment in other, in other areas, um, and it's potentially the, the exchange rate issue. Now, we actually know relatively little about those constituent processes. And, and, and certainly, it's, I've intended to do a lot more research into this, but I haven't had the time, unfortunately. Um, for the US, the misallocation number was only 20%. The majority of their costs came through the financial crisis. So what that suggests is that the distortionary effects of an oversized financial sector appear to be much greater for the UK. Um, now, as much as the big number got a lot of media attention, and it did, it went around the world, and we had we had coverage in the Financial Times in Le Monde, uh, who did a double page spread on it. We 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 were in the Guardian, we were we were in the Independent. It it, it kind of went around the world, and we had the the we had the Wall Street Journal onto us as well. Um, it's it's really what's going on 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 under the surface in that misallocation category. That, that matters and that's what's really important here why these processes appear so much more pronounced in the UK I want to finish off just by saying the other thing about the finance curse and what makes it really interesting is not the numbers in a way the number that we generated I think is the least interesting thing about the concept at the risk of doing my own research down here and that this is the point that really the finance curse is simultaneously a social, political and geographical phenomenon all at the same time. So as a concept, it's at least three different things. Firstly, it's a, it's a diagnosis of the major problem confronting the UK economy. And it should be framing the debate about how we govern the UK economy. Secondly, from an academic perspective, it's a multifaceted research agenda. There are the economic costs and processes that I've just talked about, um, but there are social and geographical aspects to be investigated. Um, finance and wealth concentrations produce all kinds of distortionary effects. Um, they produce patterns of geographical overdevelopment and geographical underdevelopment. A colleague of mine in urban studies, uh, Roland Atkinson, has recently written a book about London called Alpha Cities. And that shows how influxes of wealth into London because of its status as a financial center is transforming neighborhoods in really bad ways for existing, existing residents. Connected to that is kind of patterns of rising inequality and the social contract and social cohesion coming under threat uh, from countries with, in countries with big, big financial sectors. And possibly the most interesting from my perspective uh, process is changes in the political wiring so that public policy becomes all about financial imperatives, needs and logics. So even in the UK case, when we look at something like Brexit and it's genuinely considered that is bad for an establishment city of London, many of the strongest supporters and donors were a new cadre of renegade financiers centered around the hedge fund industry. Um, in this country, in the UK, we often think the UK has, un, has had no industrial policy since the 1980s, but it's very clear there has been industrial policy aimed at promoting the status and standing of the City of London. So there's that kind of multifaceted social science research agenda there. The third thing is that the finance curse is also a political narrative. It tells us what the problem is in two simple words, finance curse. And I remember when John and um, Nick were first talking about this, they said they wanted something that could fit on a placard. But what it really does that's important is that it challenges the accepted 
wisdom that the city and finance is good for the country as a whole. And I think that that needs to become part of our political discourse and our political debate more generally. Thanks very much. And I think I'll just throw in a, a little supplementary there, um, which is that um, you sort of mentioned Alpha Cities and the place of London and, you know, in the context of the government's whole levelling up agenda and the fact that we're doing this for the festival debate, which is based in Sheffield. Um, would you say that um, the finance curse you perhaps hits particularly hard at Northern England, at perhaps also South Wales, some of the poorest areas of the country? And also, just because as a politician, I know what it's like when you produce a figure, I know all too well, um, was there much pushback on the 4,500 billion figure? What kind of reactions did you get? So geography, a little bit more on geography and, 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 and the reaction to the figure. Yeah, I was going to say something about, about geography. So, you know, I think that one of the things we need to see happen is cities around the world through a new form of municipalism, um, discover their own development strategies and techniques. And at the center of that diagnosis has to be putting the extractive activities of finance at the center of a new policy agenda. And we can kind of see that thing happening in experimental form in the UK through things like the Preston model. And that maybe provides the outlines of a recipe for other cities across the North of England. But it's fairly obvious that cities across the North of England have had the brunt of this kind of finance curse effect to some extent and some degree. Um, on the pushback, uh, that's the interest. The most we really saw in the form of a pushback was Howard Davis, who was the former chair of the Financial Services Authority in either the Guardian or the Financial Times, I can't remember which, saying that the, the research we had done was more controversial than some similar research done at the Bank for International Settlements. And the Bank for International Settlements, for people who don't know, is the kind of international organization for central banks. So it's very difficult not to be more controversial than the Bank for International Settlements. And if you're not slightly more controversial than the Bank for International Settlements, you're probably doing something wrong. So I took that as a compliment. The other thing that happened was one Friday night, we got this chap from the uh, Wall Street Journal contacting us, who basically told us he wanted to do a takedown piece that, um, that destroyed the numbers, but he wanted to clarify a few things with us first. Uh, so we got into a long, prolonged discussion with him. And I remember that on that Friday night, it was my, my first wedding anniversary since my wife had recovered from cancer. So I was being told, don't talk to this fan, uh, Wall Street Times journalist any longer. And I was getting into, getting into kind of domestic strife territory. So in the end, I, I, I palmed him off to my, to my colleagues. And uh, suffice to say, they were very, very uh, efficient at disarming him. And in the end, he decided not to publish because he realized he didn't have the case, quite the case he thought he did. So um, so the answer is no, very little pushback, but they're, they're the two stories connected to it. Uh, a, a real insight there into you know, the challenges of being in public life, you know, all, the, all of the, the challenges that might have. So I think we sort of started off perhaps by talking about tax havens. Um, Nick, coming back to you, how does this, the tax haven situation and the finance curse kind of fit together? Sorry, um, can I ask Andrew a quick question? It's a, a bit of a curveball question, but given your interest in football, um, would you fit the European Super League fiasco into um, a finance curse, curse frame? Was it too late in the evening to get into that complicated story? <laughs> You'll need to unmute, yeah. Yeah, but uh, it's, uh, there's a kind of long-running history of that. I mean, so, so I, we set the football club up precisely because we could see something like the European Super League coming down, down the stream. So that was what we could see happening on Merseyside and in Liverpool in particular were absentee foreign owners taking the, city further, uh, taking the football club further and further away from the city's population. So in a way, that was, yes, and uh, you know, I, I in a way saw that, saw kind of that kind of extractive relationships um, taking place. And yeah, I suppose it, you could see it as an offshoot of the finance curse. Um, but we, we, set up, we set up the football community to be a civic institution, given that these multinational brands, as they were becoming, no longer functioned as a civic institution. And as far as we're concerned, were no longer fit for civic purpose. Okay, um, 
so to answer your question, Natalie, about tax havens, so how does the um, finance course fit with a tax haven analysis? So I already mentioned one one aspect is that, you know, the tax havens is a financial center that transmits harm outwards. The finance course says if your financial center is too big, it transmits harm inwards to your own country. But there's another whole kind of dimension to this. Um, and there's a word begins with C and I've heard it in tax haven after tax haven. And you, I heard it in the UK so many times. Once you start listening out for this word, you'll find it all over the place. Um, it became a little bit more muted after the financial crisis, but it's coming back. I think Andrew knows which word I'm coming up with. It's competitiveness. And so they're always saying, we can't do these reforms. We can't regulate finance too much. We can't tax the bankers too much. We can't, you know, taxes have got to be low. Otherwise, we'll become uncompetitive. And all the money will run away to Geneva or Singapore or Zurich or Panama or wherever. And they always sort of wield this kind of fear that all the money is going to run away. So we can't, you know, we've got to give the bankers what they want or they're all going to run away and they will be poorer. And that is a really powerful political tool. You just bring out that thing. We're going to become uncompetitive. You've got to be open for business. We've got to, you know, um, let them, you know, there's this kind of sea of capital roaming the world, um, financial capital, you know, at the click of a mouse, it can move from one place to the next. And we've just got to do everything we can to, to attract this capital. And um, it, it's, it's, it's really deep in the British psyche, I think, this idea. And people always worry, you know, they say, well, we, we know there's something wrong with the city of London. We know there's, you know, the, the bankers are doing some bad stuff, but we, we can't do too much because, you know, they'll all run away and we'll be poorer. Well, the first thing to say is the finance curse shows clearly that if those kinds of bankers, the ones who do run away when you put in place regulation to protect your economy or taxation in order to, you know, have revenues that you want to, you know, uh, uh, have better education system, for example, um, if they run away because you tax them too much, then those are the sort of people that were causing the trouble in the first place. Um, and so the finance curse tells us we need to shrink the financial sector. We need to shrink it in the right way, obviously not in, um, uh, you know, some uh, crazy way. But if you shrink the financial center in the right way, the finance curse tells us your economy will be better off. We'll all be richer. We'll all be more prosperous. We'll be more equal will be a more balanced um, society. So how do we shrink it in the right way? What we do basically is we put in place those policies that people want, that, that, that voters want. Um, we, voters overwhelmingly want, even conservative voters want higher, higher taxes on, uh, on wealthy, very wealthy individuals, um, on, multi, on multinationals, you know, who would, who would be against really taxing Google or Facebook a little bit more? Um, so and, and stronger regulation, protective regulations. You know, if you just take away all the regulations, they will the predators will come out in force. And that's what they're doing. So we need to have the right kind of regulations, good, strong regulations. Um, and this idea of competitiveness is a completely bogus concept because there's kind of two things going on here. One is <clears throat> there's two ways you can think about this. One is um, what I call downgrading, which is the competitiveness thing, you know, cut, you know, give loopholes to multinationals in the pathetic hope that they'll bring some activity of some kind over here or deregulate your financial sector so that some, you know, bad actors will come in or criminals will send their money here or whatever. Um, all this is the kind of competitiveness. It's downgrading. It's it's making your economy, in a sense, worse off because you think somehow you know, the rich people are going to come, the money's going to come. But the finance curse tells us this this kind of money coming in will make us poorer. The other kind of thing that could be called competitiveness, but I think is it's actually a bad term for it, is, is what I would call upgrading, which is things like building a better education system, you know, investing in, in infrastructure, investing in, uh, you know, uh, a good sort of health system, a good, um, you know, uh, government providing uh, providing targeted support to, to, to industries. Um, you know, we have some good healthcare industries here that, that have, you know, helped find cures for COVID and stuff like that with a lot of government support. That kind of stuff is, is what you call upgrading. Now, is this competitiveness? Not really, because, you know, if, if we build a better education system, you know, is that going to make Germans worse off? Is it going to make French people or Americans worse off? No, it's it might make them better off. But this is nothing to do with any competition with anybody. This is just about our own economy, our own productivity, and that's kind of upgrading. 
So there are these kinds of confusions. You know, they wheel out this word competitiveness and everybody sort of runs scared. And a lot of politicians do too. Probably most politicians haven't really thought about it. But once you think about it, we don't need to do these things in order to compete with other nations. This capital that comes in in response to these incentives, these bad incentives, these downgrading incentives, exactly the kind of capital we don't want. We want to look after our eco own economy. We want to have, you know, fair tax systems. We want to invest in local communities instead of investing in the city of London. And there's a video out there you can, you can look for with Boris Johnson back when he was mayor of London saying, you know, if you invest in money in London, in Croydon, you're going to, um, you'll, you'll do much better for people in Strathclyde, which is, by the way, is no longer an administrative unit of Scots Scotland. That's what he said. He said, to make people in Strathclyde richer, you have to invest in London. In other words, the city is the kind of golden goose. You invest in it and it kind of showers money and tax revenues on the rest of the economy. That's the very common pub public perception that the city is the engine, you know, the golden goose. Um, and we need to kind of row, row back this, this idea because you know, as I said, part of the financial sector is essential. As Andrew said, you know, we need finance to do certain things. We need it to do the useful things and we need to have it carefully regulated so that it does the useful things. Um, but beyond that, those things that the financial sector does that the economy doesn't need, we need to shrink it. So you get this kind of, you know, an, another way of putting a, the finance curse on a placard is shrink finance for prosperity. Um, you know, we need a smaller city, a better city and we'll be better off for it. And we don't need to chase this will-o'-the-wisp of international competitiveness in, in financial services, because that is a fool's errand and it will take us in exactly the wrong direction. And it's fascinating that that Boris jo Johnson comment very much echoes the now infamous comment from Gordon Brown in Mansion House speech just before the um, financial crash, which was you basically saying that Britain was going to be sailing on to the future you know, the, the wonderful uplands of the future, having abolished boom and bust um, on the back of the financial sector and all of our brilliant bankers. And it's astonishing that, you know, that lessons really still really haven't been learned from that. And what you were saying actually about, you know, the financiers relocating, I remember actually, oddly enough, George Osborne did change something about the taxation of... Um, of hedge funds people and there was you know a huge outcry that all of the hedge funds were going to leave and we all be worse off and there was this canton in switzerland where they were going to move to where there was only a tiny fraction of the uh, of the of the tax rate um and someone actually went to this canton in switzerland which basically consisted of the side of, a, of, of an alp for a mountain um you know with, with some cows on it and, and you know occupied by about a few hundred farmers and you know, one or two um, of, of groups did move there, and then quietly a year or so moved back because you know people in finance are also people too, and you know they have lives, they have families, they have kids in school, and all those sorts of things. So it's I think it's often not as not as mobile as thought. But I will actually I'm hoping someone's going to post in the comments. I actually wrote a piece for Yorkshire Bylines, which if people haven't encountered it, um, uh, it's a really excellent local part of a, a national network of some alternative media that's doing some really interesting things. I actually wrote a piece about competitiveness for that, uh, for the Yorkshire Bylines that really, you know, pre it presented some of those ideas. They indeed, some of those ideas came from you um, uh, there in that talk. So. Andrew, sort of back to you, just to perhaps have some brief reflections on, on the tax finance curse nexus. Okay, uh, just before I do answer that, let me let me, let me me give a fuller answer to Nick's earlier question about football, which I should have said at the start. Uh, you know, both Liverpool and Manchester United was, were subject to leverage buyouts by, Amer by essentially by American investment firms. And so what we saw in the case, Liverpool's no longer leverage, but Manchester United still is. But what we saw there was the model was to extract revenue from the football club to acquire an asset for zero, basically, on the behalf of the investors. Um, and so that very much kind of typical finance curse type type dynamics in a way, and it's it's indicative of the kind of things that we see in this highly financialized infrastructure um, that, that, have, that has been systematically created. On the tax question, I've been doing some work with a colleague, Richard Murphy, who's about to become a part-time professor uh, at the University of Sheffield Management School where we look at, in detail at the sets of incentives and procedures and behaviours in the UK tax system. And when you to undertake that kind of exercise, it becomes immediately apparent that income earned from investments in financial products and assets is taxed far more generously than income earned from employment or employing people even. 
And I would argue that is a symptom of a finance curse effect, where financial imperatives and logics begin to drive many areas of public policy. And so we need to ask the question, is that a sensible way to run a tax system? Where we would rather encourage people to invest in financial assets rather than earning by engaging in productive acti activities that could benefit society as a whole. One of the things we uncovered is that the UK tax system offers 400 billion a year in tax reliefs. So that's revenue the government chooses not to collect. And to give you a sense, that's twice the annual budget of the NHS. And we also found that 81% of UK net wealth is held in heavily tax incentivized assets. So that's the tax system effectively providing a subsidy to the already asset rich. Our estimate that is around about 25 to 30% of that 400 billion in reliefs is used for that purpose. So I think coming out this, this pandemic, we need to have a very serious conversation if that's the best way to design our tax system, especially as the pandemic has laid bare the multifaceted nature of inequality in this country and how severe and lethal that can be. So do we really want a tax system that makes financiers out of us all and acts as a kind of rentiers and orders charter? Or do we want to set about redesigning it so it reduces rather than amplifies inequality? But again, I'd emphasize this is related to and a symptom of the finance curse, because in a way, the finance curse is about structural power. It's about how, how a financialized mindset becomes predominant in how we design our public policy. And the tax system is, of course, probably one of our most important public administrative systems that supports other public services. Now, while we endlessly audit these other public services for value for money, we never do likewise for the tax system. We never evaluate the extent to which it is meeting the objectives we might want to set for it, such as to be redistributive and to reduce rather than worsen inequality. Um, and to ask, is it supportive of energy transition and a sustainable economy, for example? Um, so I think we need to start evaluating tax systems around the world in this way and identify systematically how they can be changed to do much better in these regards. Sorry, lost my cursor there for a second. Um, yes, it was it was the kind of contemplating asking the government to do that. I was imagining myself doing that in the House of Lords and seeing the uh, the look of the minister's face opposite when I present that one. I, uh, stay tuned to this space, as you might say, because I think I might have a go at that somewhere along the line. So I think we've covered an enormous amount of ground already, and we've kind of charted where we've been and what we've discovered in the past. So looking a bit towards the forward, um, Nick, what are you working on at the moment coming off the back of the Finance Curse book? Well, um, I have, I, I've taken uh, an increasing interest, and it's something I've been watching for some time, uh, an inc increasing interest in monopolies and power. Um, and uh, this obviously happens in the financial sector, but it happens all across the economy. Um, so I when I started working with the Tax Justice Network in its very, very early years, um, what we had was a kind of story, a really good story about that was completely different. There was this sort of standard story out there that tax havens were kind of fine, bit of a you know, few crooks and stuff, not really a problem. We had a whole new kind of analysis that a small group of us was sort of put together um, that I kind of laid out in my book, Treasure Islands. And we watched this story become really, really influential um, quite quickly. It just it sort of spread like wildfire. We went to different constituencies, like you know we started with with you know NGOs looking at development in Africa. Um, uh, you know, they were all worried at the time about you know aid levels. We've got to get aid levels up and more money going in. And we were saying, look, you know, there's ten times as much money coming out under the table and being stashed in tax havens. You need to look at that. And they were like. Oh my God! Yes, you're right. And there's the, and they sort of went off and did it. And then you know we started talking to trade unions and all sorts of other people. And people you know people worried about crime, you know financial crime and stuff. And it was very very successful having this story and um, waking waking people up. I've seen in the last five years um, in the United States something similar happening with monopolies. There's this whole new story. There's this small group of people, group, small 
group of organizations, but now it's really spreading to other sort of you know, journalists are picking up all over the place. It's a huge story now in the United States about monopolies, about how the Chicago school has um, basically created a whole story about monopolies back in the 1970s, about that we don't need to worry about power, we don't need to worry about you know the structure of markets, we don't need to worry about inequality. All we need to worry about is the internal efficiency of corporations. You know, if big is, you know, with big corporations you get economies of scale. That's wonderful. Don't worry about mergers; they're great. Um, don't worry about and 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 also focus on consumers. You know, consumer welfare. As long as consumers are happy, everything else is fine. You know, it'll all come out, out in the wash. We've seen since then the rise of massive global corporations. You know, in every sector: big pharma, big finance, big accounting, big tech, um, especially big tech. I mean, they have. They've been just buying up companies all over the place, corrupting markets all over the place. Um, you know, nobody can stop them. And so that Chicago school just let all this happen. And there's been almost no blocking of mer mergers. I mean, you know, even in Europe, I mean, there's stories about European authorities blocking a few mergers here and there. And it has happened. And there have been a few fines. Um, but basically, they have also let it all hang out. And we've got big everything now. Um, and so many of the things, you know, the products you see on supermarket shelves, they look like they come from different companies, but actually there's just a few a few big big giants like Unilever or Nestle or whatever that really own all these brands. And um, so I, that's what I'm, I'm kind of interested in. And, and I'm interested in starting a new kind of, I think this story, um, you know, I don't think the monopolization is quite as bad in the UK or in Europe as it is in the United States, but it's pretty bad. And once you, it's one of these things again, once you start looking for it and understanding what's going on, um, it's huge and it's everywhere. And so we've started with a, I, I'm working with a competition lawyer and also with John Christensen, who was my partner in crime on tax havens um, to set up a new organization called the Balanced Economy Project. And uh, we really just in the in the process of starting it up. So we, we want to start spreading the word about monopolies and it all ties in with the tax havens, with the finance curse. Um, there's so much, it's, it's such a rich area. So that's what I'm working on. Well, you're reminding me, actually, it was also at Sheffield University. I went to an excellent um, talk from a Canadian academic whose name escapes me at the moment. I don't know if anyone else on the call knows it, um, but she was talking about how, um, and this was about the food system, and how there's five or six big um, seed companies that's coming down to three or four, the agrochemical companies supplying the fertilizer and, and the and the pesticides is five or six companies. And actually, if you look at all the big manufacturers, there's heaps and heaps of brand, but actually there's five or six companies. And there was a trend that five or six companies is becoming three or four companies and it's just becoming more and more concentrated. Um, My name's Jennifer Clapp. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs> um, I, 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 terrible at remembering names it's one of my weaknesses but um yeah it, 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 you know it, it truly is horrifying when you start to see it and you start to pin down and i'm also very interested as an ag science graduate in the whole issue of resilience and how fragile systems can be if they're so concentrated the kind of practical fragility as well as the financial implications so um again looking forward to you with you andrew what um what can be done to lift the finance curse and what are you doing on it now and, and looking forward to the future? Well, I'd, I'd flag five areas. Um, the first one's the, t the tax uh, system that I mentioned before. So that's a question of reforming tax systems so they don't make it easier to earn income from financial assets uh, rather than income from employment. And we set the objective of them for them of reducing rather than increasing inequality. Um, the second is to actually make curbing and reducing finance curse effects and symptoms an objective of financial regulation. Um, we need measurement and numerical rates in, in financial regulation and that's important for how we regulate our financial system. But financial regulation cannot be entirely about that. We need to train regulators so they're prepared to ask if a financial activity has underlying social worth and be prepared to reach judgments on that. And we need to pose a fundamental question about what kind of financial system we want to have, what purpose it sh should have. So if you want a financial system to support a just inclusive energy transition, uh, and materials transition, then design regulation with a view to that and make it an explicit objective. Unfortunately, for a variety of reasons, that is a question never asked. 
of financial reg regulation. Measurement and making the system as a whole more resilient is, is seen as enough. Um, and one of the reasons for that, I think, is that politicians, um, particularly in this country, present company accepted, obviously, uh, Natalie, have by and large abdicated on financial questions in this country because they're regarded as too complex uh, and, and everything is deferred to a range of experts and the industry itself. So in short, we need to broaden our conception of financial regulation and we need to set objectives that are informed by big challenges we as a species face. Um, set, thirdly, it needs a corporate governance agenda. And so some research that we did last summer, um, which Adam Lever led from the Sheffield Management School, and also involved uh, two of my favorite people in the world, colleagues from Copenhagen Business School, Len Seabrook and Dun Duncan Wigan, amongst others, and Richard Murphy was also involved in that. We found that 35% of S&P uh, 500 firms were distributing more in dividends and something called buybacks than their net group income over the previous 10 years. For FTSE 100 companies, it was 28%. Um, in January 9, 2019, uh, in the year, in the accounting year leading into January 2019, U.S. companies had distributed 126.8% of the free cash flow. So that's a not large number of companies making excess payouts, and they were doing this by bringing formal optimistic revenue projections forward and pushing costs back. So it was an accounting manipulation. And we estimated that about 20% of the world's major companies were looking very vulnerable going into the pandemic because they'd taken on large amounts of low-grade debt to fund those kinds of redistributions. Um, <clears throat> so the report that we, that we issued on that, um, one of the main proposals in it was to introduce a dividend cover limit that simply says you can't pay out more than you earn in net income at group level without member approval. And without that, what you see is this pattern where a significant minority of the world's leading firms will pay out excess amounts. And that in a way is a symptom of that financialized mindset uh, that the finance curse diagnoses. Um, so what we see is senior management getting very large bonuses and it's really only po made possible by accounting sleight of hand. So corporate governance reform needs to take on that issue particularly. Um, the fourth strand, I think, is localism. Um, I mentioned before this new municipalism based around community wealth building. The Preston models, the obvious example in the UK, using the procurement process and community anchor institutions to make council spending and contracts head in the direction of community-oriented businesses and some of them, some of the cooperatives. And if you speak to the leader of Preston Council, Matthew Brown, you will see that he saw extraction by multinationals and investment funds as a fundamental problem that required a solution to. So community wealth building is, in, is part of a specific localized response to the dynamic of the finance curse. What we need to do is we need to know more about what works and what doesn't work in that context. But the community wealth building philosophy needs to be developed in a range of places uh, and its own economic strategy developed. Um, we can see uh, signs of this going on around the world today. And the kind of fearless cities movement is a kind of global rollout of that community wealth building philosophy. Um, the final thing relates to processes of political capture. So I've got a project uh, with uh, Roland Atkinson, who I mentioned earlier, and that's on, on wealth and concentrations of wealth, on what happens to city when they attract wealth and financial investments, including whether that city's public and social institutions and spaces become captured. And in, in particular, that raises the question of how we put in place government mechanisms that curb that process of capture. Um, we also need that in finance. Um, in, in, in the sphere of finance, what we see is, is industry lobbies dominating because of extremely technical questions. Um, and so what we have to do in a way is build institutional counterweights that are tasked with scrutinizing new, new regulatory proposals um, 
and identify the bits in those proposals that run counter to, to public interest and may excessively bit benefit the industry to other actors. So we need to proactively, institutionally innovate to make the politics of financial regulation and governance much more pluralistic. One thing we could do um, at the EU level, there's something called Finance Watch, which was created by the European Parliament. A modified UK version of that is something we, we've talked about previously, Natalie. But that's the kind of thing um, that we need to do. And if I was pushed to pick, put, put, put a sixth thing on the agenda, it would be about creating a green development bank with all kinds of regional offices. But I'm not doing any work on that. But my, my colleague, Richard, Richard Murphy, that's a big thing for him. Right. And yes, and it was interesting, actually, the I put the amendment um, twice on to establish the finance watch. I mean, I knew I wasn't going to get it through, but it did definitely attract more interest and more engagement, perhaps, um, from across the house than we've seen in others. And it's certainly something I'm going to keep pursuing. And I think it was very interesting. I mean, I've only been in the House of Lords for about 18 months and these were my first finance bills. And we, we ended up with what the government probably called as the terrible trio, which was my it was um, Lord Seeker, who's a Labour Lord, who's actually an accounting professor. Um, so he really has some technical skills and knowledge. Uh, and the Bishop of St Albans and myself, and I suspect the government called this the terrible trio because we were the ones putting in the progressive, more regulation, more controls amendments. Um, uh, and... What I'm going to aim to do when you were talking about the institutional issues there is I think we've got to get a lot more politicians and my focus is obviously in the House of Lords, people who are concerned about social issues, people who are concerned about inequality and um, wage levels and, um, you know, all the difficulties our institutions are running into because so much money is being pumped out into dividends, try and get them engaged in the, in the financial bills, which is going to be a challenge, but it's certainly something that I'm planning to work on. And actually, there's also um, Lord Davies of Brixton, I have hoped, might, might also become engaged in this. So it's something very much working on. Okay, so we've talked for an hour and this is the chance where we the, the, the time where we hand it over and come back to some of your questions uh we've only got about half an hour left so just a reminder to anyone listening on any of the channels if you post any questions that come in we've got quite a stack already so you better get them quite quickly if you're going to have any chance that we'll get to them uh post questions and they'll be ferried through to us i think i'm going to start with a couple of questions um that are kind of linked together um I don't know where these came from, sorry, but the Biden administration has announced new corporate tax proposals aimed at dealing with some of the levels of multinational products and tax havens. Um, and the question is, should the UK be doing the same? And another question came from another source saying, what can the UK do to support these efforts? Perhaps, Nick, if I can start with you. OK, uh, yeah, so... The Biden tax proposals are very welcome because countries around the world for years and years have been saying, oh, we've got to cut our taxes. You know, we've got to be more competitive. And um, Biden, alongside the new tax proposals, came out, came some statements like we want to stop this rate to the race to the bottom. We're going to actually start going in the other direction. We're going to start putting tax rates up. And they're calling for minimum global corporate tax rates, which are actually potentially a very effective tool because... If you have an international agreement for minimum um, effective corporate tax rates, then if a company escapes tax in one country, they know it's going to get topped up somewhere else. So there's not really so much point. There's not really a, any point escaping tax if, if this system is put in place. We've had the UK so, um, and, and the G7 countries have basically agreed on this concept. And it's a good concept. You know, B Biden's proposal is a good proposal. And, this, you know, this is. Um, you know, I, I, when he came in, I was really skeptical. I saw him as a kind of, um, you know, light Democrat, sort of third way -ish sort of character. But I've been really pleasantly surprised by a lot of what he's what he's done. So this is this is a good, good proposal. Most G7 countries have sort of agreed that this is a good proposal. Britain, however, has um, decided to stand out and say, well, uh, we don't really want to do this. But they haven't done it in, in, a, in a way of like attacking the proposal. They just said we want even more we want to do even more stuff and that's a standard way of stopping anything happening if you make it too difficult then everything falls apart so that's kind of where we are so the uk um you know i i don't know exactly where that position is coming from um i know that the biden tax proposals would be very damaging to uk tax havens um or to, to financial interests in those tax havens i'm not saying they'll be bad for the populations of those tax havens necessarily um so, but there, I think there's that kind of game is probably going on. I, I don't know the ins and outs of where the UK's position is coming from, but it's it's not a good place to be. It's not a good look either. 
No, I, I can remember I actually uh, fairly early on um, did actually, you know, looking across the virtual dispatch box, looked at the minister and said, will you back this? And, you know, if you watch a minister dancing on the head of the pin, trying not to say anything, it was it was a very classic case study of the genre. Um, Andrew, anything you'd like to add to that? And also, I'm, I'm interested, this is perhaps slightly putting you on the spot, but I mean, before the last US election, before they selected the um, Democrat candidate, I mean, I was something of a fan of Elizabeth Warren. You know, is Biden getting into the sort of level of um, radical um, nature that, that Elizabeth Warren was suggesting? You know, how, how would you rank where Biden's at at the moment? Um, I'll, come back to the, I'll come back to the Biden bit. And I'll kind of come back to it through the through the tax route. Um, so the first thing I'd say about corporation tax is we have to understand that it performs a very specific role in tax systems, and it's not what people think it is, which is not there to raise all this revenue, at least not in in big countries like the United States and the United Kingdom. Really, what its role is is as a backstop to reinforce other aspects of the tax system. So what you want, so you the reason you, corporate tax exists is to stop what high net worths shifting all their income and assets into corporate structures so it can reside there untaxed. Now, if you're constantly cutting corporation tax, you create an incentive. So in the UK, the, 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 the gap is 45% plays 19% currently, right? So what does that do? It creates a huge incentive if you're a wealthy individual to shift as much of your income into corporate structures as possible because you'll pay a lot less. Um, so that tells us that corporation tax isn't doing what it was set up to to do because, because of this competitive dynamic, this race to the bottom that Nick has referred to. So let's think about Biden's proposals in that context. When David Cameron came to power in 2010, the UK rate was 30. Biden wants to draw a red line at 21. So. You're not even, if we go back even further to the early 2000s, the average rate around the world was 32.5. So you're not even repairing the damage that's been done over the last 20 years. And you're not, and you're certainly not re re repairing the damage that has been done um, after uh, two decades of kind of competitive cutting uh, since the birth of what we know today as neoliberalism. So really, what, what the Biden measure is, is a conservative status quo measure. It's going to stop things from getting much worse, but it's not repairing the damage that's been done over the last 10 years. Um, and if you want uh, an indication of the damage, there was a piece of IMF research done in 2014 that showed that that kind of competitive race to the bottom uh, was costing developing countries most, and they were losing around 13% of their annual revenues through that kind of competitive downward spiral. Um, so we, you know, collectively as a society, we have to do something about that, but we've got to change our norms. Biden's step is a first step, but we need to go much further. As I've suggested, what we need to start doing is systematically evaluating tax systems to see what they're doing in relation to redistribution and to think about corporation tax in that context as a kind of something that reinforces the rest of the tax system. Um, so on to, on to, on to Biden and, and Warren. Um, I, think, I, think, I think Biden has been, been a breath of fresh air so far. I think it's encouraging that he has a place for Bernie Sanders in his cabinet. I think that's, that's important. I think I think the thing that we that the world really needs the United States to do is the Green New Deal and to be very serious about doing that. Um, and so if Biden, if Biden realizes that this is a moment where we're about to enter a massive existential crisis and he has that responsibility on his shoulders and steps up to the plate, then obviously we'll all be delighted. But that's what needs to happen. The, the corporate tax thing, it's a step in the right direction, but I, and I guess that Nick would agree with me on this. We actually need to go much further than just 21. 
Yeah, I just I'll, I'll come back to you, Nick, and just also add in. There's another question in the um, that, that's come through um, about the the impact of particularly tax havens on developing countries. So Andrew made reference to the to the damage of, of tax competition being done. So perhaps if we can respond to the to the Biden Warren question and also um, perhaps you know, reflect on that a little. Are you asking? Shall I respond to that? Yeah. So, um, yeah, th this question of lower income countries, developing countries is very, very important. And in fact, that, that is one another criticism that you could make of the Biden, Biden proposal. Um, it is uh, very much it, it would in the in the way it is structured. Um, you know, the lion's share of revenues would end up with rich countries because it it would basically be collected um, mostly by countries where, you know, multinationals have their headquarters. Um, there are proposals by the Tax Justice Network and others for a, a different kind of system, which is not so different, which is related to what Biden, you know, I think they're generally supportive of the Biden tax proposals, um, where you would uh, allocate taxing rights to countries on a different basis. And basically according to the economic substance of where stuff happens. So when, you know, a multinational invests from the United States into, I don't know, Tanzania or somewhere like that, um, you know, the question arises, you know, who gets, to, you know, profits are made from that investment. Who gets to tax it? Is it the United States? Is it Tanzania? Well, the NGO's proposal, um, which is actually getting quite wide support, um, is is to rebalance that so that Tanzania gets a fair, you know, there is a, you know, of course, the multinational has technology and capital that it provides that, you know, the in deserve, United States deserves some, some tax revenues, but in the developing countries, they have workers who are providing a lot of value. They have infrastructure, they have, you know, education system stuff, which are also providing contribution to the profit. So they should get a fair fair cut as well. So that is something that um, there's a thing called the minimum effective tax rate, which is a, a, a kind of name of the proposal if you're interested in looking at it. So I think that's a, that's a very important question. And another another thing I think is very important to, to understand, and this, the Biden administration seems to have got this, is that a lot of people see this as a sort of question of one country against another. You know, is 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 this, you know, is America protecting its own multinationals um, against other country? You know, other countries ta taxing them. You know, and that has been the way that U.S. governments have for a long time, and, and governments around the world have regarded. You know, have seen this problem. But there's a different way of seeing it, and there are signs that the Biden administration is seeing it significantly in this way. Is that this is a battle um, to tax you know, mobile capital on behalf of citizens in rich countries and in poor countries together. And so there's a kind of, it's a different, it's a different agenda. It's a kind of, um, you know, we are the 99%, not just here, but over there. And we have a shared interest in finding, developing tax systems that actually tax multinationals proper, properly because they're getting away with murder. They're getting away with, you know, ever lower tax rates plus a load of loopholes. Um, so that's kind of the mentality that we're beginning to see. You know, it is early days. There's many obstacles. There's lots of people in the administration who I wouldn't necessarily, necessarily agree with, but I've been quite heartened. And on this monopolies thing that I've been looking at as well, um, some of the leading lights of that, of this new anti-monopoly movement in the United States, which we don't have really over here, but some of the leading lights have been appointed to quite senior positions. So there's a lot of encouraging stuff there. Um, again, you know, up to a point, and we'll see where, where it goes. But uh, I think there's a lot to be hopeful about. Do I have time for one other point? I think what what's very interesting in the United Kingdom is that I think people see this as a sort of Labour versus Tories thing. I think that actually inside the Tory party, there are lots of people who kind of agree with the sort of stuff that I'm saying. I, well, I know there are because I've been talking to some of them um, and in the Labour Party as well and with you, Natalie, and, you know, this is a kind of, this is potentially a cross-party issue. I mean, there's lots of conservatives who are on the side of what you might call capital and vested interests and getting the contracts and making a lot of money. Um, you know, that's huge. But there are also conservatives who, you know, believe in sort of traditional conservative principles and the idea of markets being corrupted and not, don't fit well. And, and there are people who, you know, conservatives who are interested in, you know, local communities, the prosperity of local communities. And um, they understand that leveling up is threatened by, you know, predatory players in the city extracting wealth from um, from poorer regions. You know, they're, they're not, you know, they're not fools. So there is this interesting kind of dynamic. And I think um, if we can, you know, propagate this, this, this kind of analysis, you know, this idea of shrink the city for prosperity, shrink it in smart ways. Um, I think 
we can pick up support all across the political spectrum from from left to right yes and um i, I very much agree with that and um i think we we've, we've sort of got about 14 minutes or so i'm going to try and end on time so um let, let's try and think a bit more perhaps about positive solutions um and there's a question from luke drury um talking about aren't decentralized solutions better for citizens I'm not quite sure what he means here, but he says um, free of government policy and intervention, faster settlement and remittance. That could be taken in lots of different directions, but perhaps start with that local point. One of the things I find, particularly when I talk to um, German Green Party members and politicians, one of the things I say, picking up some points we made earlier, is, you know, what we need to do is, is have local and regional banks that really understand their communities and really they're putting support into their communities, not some centralised office where you have to put in a business plan and, you know, the computer says yes or no according to your business plan without knowing anything about you or the community or the environment. Um, so, you know, going beyond perhaps the Preston model, do we need something that's much more decentralised and much less focused on London? Andrew, perhaps we can start with you. Yeah, I think I'm broadly supportive, uh, as you may have gathered from the kinds of things I was saying. And I think we're certainly seeing greater demands for increased levels of, of, of city de devolution and, and greater autonomy for city governance. And I think that that's coming through in that kind of new municipalism demands. Um, politically, the interesting thing there is that I think it's going to present a real problem for the Labour Party. Because the Labour Party, in a way, particularly under the current leadership, appears to really have lost the links to its grassroots um, in some of these communities. Uh, and, of course, uh, they are intent on purging many of the members in those communities. And so I can speak, for example, about, about one of the things that's going on in Liverpool. There's a new movement there called Beacon which is on this agenda of municipalism, greater autonomy for, for local government, uh, greater local determination. But it's based on cit uh, citizen mobilization and it's based on online platforms where citizens get to record their preferences directly. Um, and that's a very interesting development, but it's got nothing to do with the Labour Party. I mean, these are, these are people who, who in many cases are ex-Labour members, but are completely disaffected and don't believe that either the, the, the central national state or centralized party structures are going to work for them and their needs. And so they want to create an alternative at the local level. I can't really say much more than that, other than let's see how that develops. But I think it, I think it poses a real difficulty for the Labour Party, particularly the current leadership, because they're miles away from that agenda. It's taking place without them, and people are leaving in their droves, those that aren't being purged, of course. Well, it's interesting because the whole phrase, the very famous phrase, take back control. And one of the things that I was saying in 2016 um, and afterwards, you, know, I think we should very much listen to people who said they wanted to take back control because I think they're absolutely right to want to do that. You, know, They didn't have control over their local communities with low wage, often multinational company employment, call centre type employment. You know, that was what was seen as investment coming into into communities across much of the north um, and you know whether it's planning um, whether it's you know making decisions about the local school systems which are disappearing being forced by Westminster um, into academy trust chains etc you know communities have lost control of so much and people don't actually realize that the UK is um, in terms of across Europe essentially the most centralized government system across the whole of Europe and I think you know um, we have a huge problem with the lack of democracy in Westminster the Tories got 40 four percent of the vote and 100 percent of the power in 2019 but we also have a huge problem with so much power in westminster no matter who's actually in power in westminster uh, can i just so, say can i just say, say that i would advocate for a sheffield version of beacon which will probably make me very unpopular with the labor party but i don't care because i've never been a labor party member uh well i, I can think of some people in um in sheffield uh who you know it's certainly been working along those lines and very much focused on local power and local control. And of course, interesting things have happened with the It's Our City movement, which people who are listening from outside Sheffield may not know about. It hasn't got much national publicity, but it's very interesting that um, it is essentially they forced the referendum, the largest place this has ever been done, to convert the council from a cabinet system where a handful of people make decisions to a committee system where the whole, all councillors 
have a say in decisions. And it's quite a big change and quite a, a return to local control, even at the kind of ward kind of level. So I think sort of sticking with that positive line, um, there's a question also that's come in from the audience, um, Nick, which I'm going to bring to you um, about, um, we've talked talk quite a bit about the loopholes and, you know, whatever the corporate tax rate is, um, you know, how do we block the loopholes? How do we actually make whatever the rate is? How do we make corporates pay it? Now, I've got my personal answer to this, but I'll, but I'll, I'll, I'll sit on my hands for the moment and let you pick that one up, if I may. Okay. <laughs> Um, you know, the answer to this question is political. Um, there are lots of technical solutions. I mean, I can, you know, internationally, I can talk about corporate taxes. Um, there are some very interesting solutions that are being pushed forward. But uh, politicians generally, I've been reading a great book called How to Fight in Inequality by Ben Phillips, who's a historian. And he's looked at what's worked in the past and what's, what hasn't. Um, and he's got, he, he talks about this thing called the evidence-based paradox, where um, a lot of people think that if you just pre present the right evidence to the policymakers, they'll go, oh, yeah, I see. Now I get it. I, yeah, OK, we'll we'll do this. Um, but that's not how it works, of course. Um, the evidence is only it's necessary, but you need the kind of power. You need the fire underneath you before the politicians. You have to make the politicians change. So if we're going to crack down on corporate tax loopholes, I think we have certainly seen quite a lot of pushback. I think um, uh, Things would be a lot worse if we hadn't had a lot of pushback. We have people are furious about it. They look at opinion polls, and politicians do um, look at these opinion polls, and they don't like this stuff happening. And okay, I'm not going to talk about loopholes, but in fact, Rishi Sunak recently um, admitted publicly that this cutting of corporate tax headline tax rates, income tax rates, hasn't worked in attracting the investment. Um, he actually said that. Um, a conservative chancellor um, uh, just a few months ago. And and so they have actually also raised the headline corporate tax rate. At the same time, they introduced some other policies which kind of undercut it, capital allowances and so on. Um, but that statement in itself, I think, is really, really significant. And it does reflect the fact that politicians know that the public hates all these loopholes, hates tax havens, hates all this corporate tax havens, um, uh, corporate tax cutting. Um, and so this pressure, this, you know, this, the more we can get this message out um, that this stuff is bad and our economy will be better if we, you know, we'll all be better off if we, if we push back on this stuff. Um, it's very important. And so I think, you know, public messaging and politics and, and, and thinking about it from those terms is, is absolutely crucial. I wanted to just say one thing um, in response to take back control that is this slogan that everybody, everybody hears that, you know, that word control is about power um, and one of the, you know, I don't want to bang on too much about monopolies, but monopolies are, that's what they're about. They're about power. And um, one of the things I've been investigating is small business suppliers to these big platforms or to big supermarkets. And um, what you see there is the terror, the absolute fear, because these a small business supplying, you know, if it's selling on Amazon or whatever, or um, trying to sell to a big supermarket, especially if they're a small business and their products are easily replaced, the big company can switch them off like that. If they, if they get annoyed with them, they can just switch them off and their business is wiped out overnight. And nobody will talk out. But there is huge anger out there, untapped anger that is invisible. Nobody's seeing the politicians don't really see it. Um, uh, but there is a lot of anger among the and, and I think small businesses are politically a very potent community that we can tap into and we can we can talk to um, and try and represent their interests better and again i think this is an issue that can appeal all across the political spectrum and so i think if we start looking at you know we've got to start taking on these giants we've got to you know not just in finance we certainly need to take on the giants in finance we need to take on amazon we need to stop them selling their own goods on their own platform competing on a completely tilted playing field against all the other suppliers um we need to take on google we need to take on on all of these all of these giants and i think we can do it um by telling new stories and um uh, really, you know, organising, I think that is another fundamentally important thing. Plus, of course, the technical work is necessary because we need to know how to do it. But, yeah. 
Well, I think that's a really positive point uh, this evening. I mean, one of the things the festival debate always focuses on is what do we do next? And I think we've got some real answers out out, out of particularly the last 10 minutes or so. Uh, and, you know, my personal answer to um, how do we make multinational companies pay their taxes, first of all, have a government that actually wants to make them pay their tax is a very good starting point. And, you know, I think that can be very much driven by public demands that pe politicians feel that they have to do that. Um, we are running right up against the deadline in terms of time. And I think I think we've covered an enormous amount of ground. Um, I don't know. Wave your hand if there's anything you really pressingly want to say, Andrew or Nick, before the end. Um, uh, or OK, Andrew, we'll, we'll let you in as the last one. Just just on the loopholes um, question. Um, I think it was clear from what I said earlier that what I what one of the things that that's come out of that research I've been doing with Richard Murphy is an argument for systematically reviewing the system of reliefs that exist in a tax system and basically stretch testing them and saying is this fit for purpose what purpose does this serve is this working uh, f uh, and is it is it serving a good purpose is it serving good incentives or is it is it actually exacerbating inequality and being being quite regressive um just talk, just just picking up on what Nick said then about about tax and um, one of the reasons why cutting corporation tax ends up being so regressive is what we see around the world is governments sometimes compensate when they when they feel under pressure to to cut corporation tax because they're brought into this kind of competitive race discourse and dialogue but what they also do is they simultaneously broaden that tax base so they increase the numbers of actors and companies that qualify for corporation tax to compensate for the fact that they're reducing the rate. Now, the, the winners there are the most globally mobile biggest companies because what you're doing is you're shifting the tax burden from the biggest, most globally mobile companies to smaller, medium-sized enterprises. And that's fundamentally regressive. And it's one of the, uh, but, but as Nick says, that's your basis for your coalition to stop this kind of thing because m many of the costs end up getting passed down the corporate chain, if you like. And we've got to stop that kind of thing, um, and it, <clears throat> and actually seek to create more of a level playing field. Nick says he, you know, he didn't want to talk about technical solutions. I think the one big proposal to come out of the tax justice movement is a proposal for something called unitary taxation, where you'd get a company and you'd publish a set of global accounts, and you'd say this is what your world tax bill is, and that then goes to a world tax authority, who then works out a formula to distribute it to individual countries but politically that is an enormous journey firstly you've got to get countries to sign up to creating a world tax authority then you've got to agree the formula so the political barriers and obstacles to jump over to get to there is is enormous that's why i think a realistic intermediary step is to start evaluating tax systems nationally to try and reduce some of these loopholes and reliefs on a systematic basis all right, Nick, I'm going to let you in very briefly. Right, very briefly. There's one other thing that needs mentioning is our tax authorities are under attack. Um, they are being cut all over the place, all over the world. Numbers are being slashed, um, especially on, you know, big multinationals. Re-resource our tax authorities. They pay for themselves many times over. So we need to, we need proper tax authorities. We need them to be properly funded. We need them to be properly resourced. And that, I think, could be the biggest um, uh, uh, policy of all. OK, and I think we've come back to politics and the need for everyone to get involved and get engaged. And I've got a saying that politics should be what you do, not have done to you. And everyone who's come along this evening, you've been here doing politics, learning about what's happening. The next step is to go away and do something about it, whatever you can, even if that's just to talk with your friends, your neighbours, your colleagues, your family. That's a starting point. Talk about it on social media, share the link to this event, um, get the word out. And really get out the word that there's, as we've learnt, thank you very much this evening, both from Nick and Andrew, there's a huge amount of work being done in this area and lots of progress and thinking has moved on, particularly perhaps in the last six or eight years, enormously in this area. And I think there's really positive signs with that. Um, so I'll finish off by saying thank you very much to Nick and Andrew for spending, giving up your time this evening. Thank you to everyone who's listening. Um, I'm just going to, I think we had some problems hearing about festival debate at the start. So I'm just going to hand back to Chao Wei to see if we can um, manage to sort of hear a, a few words about that. Um, but from me, it's good evening and thank you everyone for coming along. 
Thank you very much, Natalie and everybody. And thanks so much to everybody who's joined us. So the Festival of Debate is pay as you feel, but we welcome any donations. If you can go to festivalofdebate.com forward slash donate, we'll really be grateful. Also, there's a survey that we've posted in, in all the, um, in all, on all the platforms in the comments, if you could just give us some feedback about tonight's event. Um, thank you very much for joining us. All events are on festivalofdebate.com. Thank you, good night. <laughs>